Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to this uh, last session for today. It's been a great day. Has everyone enjoying, been enjoying themselves? Yep, great. Uh, this talk has uh, Apache Groovy, the awesome parts, and my name is Paul King. I'm one of the contributors to Groovy, so come and ask me anything about Groovy any time during the conference. Um, this talk is all about um, just pausing for a little while. We, we're always... Uh, trying to understand what all the new features are of any language and comparing ourselves to other people. We get language envy sometimes. We see new things coming out in, in Java, in, in, in Scala, in um, uh, other different languages, and we, we sometimes forget that there's a lot of really great features in Groovy, and this is a little bit of a story about some of the features that I think are uh, quite powerful. What can I promise you? Um, this is a, a book on JavaScript, and then this JavaScript, the good parts. All I can promise is the Groovy book is a bit thicker than the JavaScript book that's there. That's, that's my only promise for the talk today. So just introducing Groovy. You, you all know Groovy. Why else will you be at this conference? It's just like a super version of Java. So many of us have a Java background. We come along into Groovy, and a lot of our pain points go away, and there's lots of really new cool things that we can do. So that's what uh, Groovy gives us. It's um, easy to learn, so it's got uh, you know almost flat learning curve. So if you've got a team of Java developers, they'll be able to become productive in Groovy very, very quickly. So you know, all know these things. Why did it come about? Well, um, there was actually uh, uh, well the, the the initial person who was um, developing Groovy actually came from a Java background and quite liked Java, but he had all these his friends who would like some Ruby hacks and small talk hacks and Python Python fans. And they were all saying, oh, Java's just, uh, that's just old hat enterprise stuff. You, you really need to get in and look at all these new languages. And well, he didn't really want to give up the JVM because there was lots of really nice things he liked about it, even some things he uh, liked about Java, but he didn't like everything about Java. So he thought it was a bit too verbose. There was features that he wanted, there was some complexity that he didn't like, and a few, a few other different things. So he said, right, let's, let's leverage off what Java gives us, but make it better. And the key things were he wanted to make it dynamic. So that was Java was always a statically typed language. And uh, he saw lots of uh, useful things happening in the Ruby and Python worlds that he thought, wouldn't it be great if I could do some of those in, in, in the JVM world? And yes, there is, is Jython and JRuby. They're great languages that also run on the JVM. But he wanted to uh, stay a bit closer to his Java roots, but want, wanted it all. So he wanted these other things. He wanted to make things simpler. So there was a lot of ceremony in uh, creating even just the Hello World application in Groovy, and he wanted to, to, to fix that. And he thought, well, while we're making things simpler, we should make writing scripts a lot simpler as well. And so, th so there's some of the things that he um, wanted to fix. And then over time, as uh, Groovy evolved and, and it, more people came on board, they wanted really good Java integration, better IDE support, uh, lots of custom features that have, that have grown or get a bit, a bit organically at times, but we've, that we're, um, lots of new features have always uh, been coming in Groovy and still r remains true. Wanted better support for concurrency, some bit of functional style, so uh, saw some things happening in the functional world, wanted that to be part of uh, this language as well. So they're all the things that um, came out into the mix and gave us what we, we know as, as Groovy today. And... Um, it, we all know that it's great for scripting. It's a uh, seamless integration with Java is one of its real strengths, and it's it's uh, really useful for domain-specific languages as well, and things like Gradle and Grails and so on. You can think of those as domain-specific languages for writing web apps and builds and so on. And and uh, a lot of people uh, use Groovy in that context. So. Um, again, many of you are very familiar with Groovy, so I don't really need to sell it on you, but. Um, I've just got some code here that's some Java code for list manipulation. And I'm going to turn it now into some Groovy code for list manipulation. So there it is there. I just renamed the file from .java to .groovy. And this is the, the low learning curve. So you can start off using Groovy with um, not much knowledge about the Groovy features. And then as you become uh, more familiar with the idioms, you can um, make things a little bit more Groovy style. So we can start off by looking at some of the, there's boilerplate information here, there's semicolons, there's um, different named methods, there's typing information that's uh, 
redundant, there's not a lot of consistency in certain places, there's some library imports that are of very, very common things. So we can sort of look at those and remove those. And even so, there's still a lot of boilerplate still there, so we can look at those and remove them a bit better. And this is the kind of thing that you would um, typically write if you were writing that same program from scratch. So um, that's much shorter, much easier to read, and we spend a lot more time reading and maintaining code than writing it. So the, it's, it's nice that when we write this bit of code, it was a lot less characters to type, but the beauty is that it's much, much easier to understand and maintain and, and uh, read. Um, this isn't where you... So most of you have seen that this has been true of Groovy for uh, over 10 years, so most of you have seen that, but it's still been evolving. So these days, you might actually go further and write a DSL instead of what you saw on the previous line. So even, even though this is fairly pretty, it's still got a few curly braces and a few... It's, uh, square brackets and things there. We might want to get rid of some of those if we're, if we're showing this to a business customer or someone like that. So you could write this DSL. There's a, this is a tiny little bit of DSL code that you'd, you'd have to implement to, to make that work. And that's the, uh, some, some code there. It's not important that you see it all, but um, it's not many lines of code is the, is the message here. We can actually keep going a little bit further because one of the problems with um, that bit of code there it's a bit hard to see in the font, especially from the back of the room, but the, the word names there has got a little uh, squiggly underline underneath it, which is it's a screenshot from IntelliJ. And if you hover over it, it says it doesn't know this symbol names. So because I'm using some dynamic features of Groovy, um, the IDE isn't, isn't quite sure what I'm doing and it can get, get a bit confused. If I right click on it, I can actually tell IntelliJ, ah, this is something that you should know about. And I can train IntelliJ manually to go and know about stuff, and then the squiggly lines will go away. So there's things that I can do. I can write little um, uh, hints also to my IDE to make those little squiggly lines go away. But we can actually do better in the language itself. So um, what we can do is start making a more type-rich little mini DSL. So before I had um, a small number of lines of code, I'm now starting to create some little domain classes that are actually part of my little DSL for this thing here, and there's actually 50 lines that stretch off the bottom of the screen that I haven't shown you, and I've now actually um, got something that's... The, the ID is now not, not confused. It knows what things I can put in all different sorts of places, and if I hover over in certain places, it's letting me uh, autocomplete and do those sorts of things. So there's a lot... I can, I can uh, go a lot further just by creating an, a, a prettier DSL. And um, I can go and this is uh, that, the DSL there uh, being run in a debugger, being single stepped. So I've put a breakpoint on the line that looks like an English line, it looks like an English line of text. It's actually groovy code. Put a breakpoint on it and it stops and it and actually shows me the, the blue cursor is in my, the little DSL language that I wrote that I showed you on the screen before. It, it, ho it hovers over there, the blue line showing me where in the, as it's stepping through the, the, the underlying implementation of the DSL where it's up to, and I can see that it's gone and filled in a, a, a size parameter, which is the thing that, that's it's come out of the, 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 uh, the program there. So that's all good. I can actually take it further still. So one of the things that, um, obviously Groovy started off being dynamic, when we, said, when we thought, oh, we better, you know, a lot of people like it groovy so much they don't want to fall back to Java to do the stuff um, to get all the full uh, type checking but w while we're adding that we might as well actually allow because we've always had a uh, tried to make the language as extensible as possible we may as well let them go stronger than Java so what you can actually do is take this a little bit further and I can supply extra extensions that I can write or that other people can write that actually make the static compiler in Groovy stronger than Java. And I, can, I can put a Haskell type system uh, onto the back of uh, my Groovy if I want to. In this particular case, I'm going to write a little ed checker. Now, what's an ed checker? If you look at my English uh, little DSL here, it's got a set of names, Ted, Fred, Jed, and Ed. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually write a type checker that looks for names that ends in ED. That's an ed checker. And there's the entire type checker there. It's, a, it's got a little callback system. The, the type checker understands these little scripts and it knows about certain uh, callback points. And here we're just going to look for any constant expressions uh, that are part of a method call that 
um, if we find that they're strings, we're going to check that they're ends in ed. So anything that's hard coded into this message, we're going to check that it ends in ed. And if it, and if it uh, doesn't, we're going to uh, throw a compile error. So what happens now? If we, if we now go and change our program, or if, if we go and run our program now, it runs exactly as before. Run, it passes, uh, compiles exactly as before and runs exactly as before. If I now go and change a couple of the names in that program to say Mary and uh, Pete, they don't end in ED. What if we compile, what if we try to run this program? Well, it won't even compile. We, we will now get a static type checking. I don't like the name Mary, I don't like the name Pete. So we can actually make things stronger than Java if we want to. And um, you're in control of that. One of the things that we've always tried to do in the Groovy language, anything that we're using to make the language work, we'll try to expose it uh, to other users of the language. So we're trying to um, give you, the, the uh, user of the language, the power to get into the, these, you've got hooks to get into all of this stuff. Okay, the, um, the next thing that we might ask is uh, what style of language is Groovy? So the, at the moment there's, um, w w I guess, imperative languages uh, won the world uh, up until you know, five years ago at least, and there's been a big push in uh, other languages, functional and, and so on. Um, there's been a debate about uh, static versus dynamic typing, so we've got the Ruby camp versus the um, C sharp and, and Java camps and so on. Um, so there's a lot of things that, um, a lot of aspects of style that Groovy could take on board. What style did it take on board? Well, it actually tries to be fairly flexible. So it actually leaves it in your hands as to uh, what style you want to do. So it's got its roots, it's got its imperative roots, but it's some, somewhat paradigm agnostic. It lets you do a fair bit of stuff. It's got, its, uh, it's got some, a little bit of uh, static type checking roots from, from its Java heritage, adds a lot of dynamic to that, and now has got the, um, the, the optional uh, type checking built on top of that. So it's actually got a lot of flexibility. So now getting on to the, uh, that's, that's my intro to Groovy to give you a bit of a flavor for it. The rest of the talk is just looking at some pillars, some things that I think uh, are the pillars that, that make uh, Groovy awesome. So um, I, I could talk all day on uh, things that I like about uh, Groovy, but I'm going to limit myself to these topics and I'm going to try to whiz through these in uh, a small amount of time, so I'm going to go fairly quickly. Um, the, there's, there's a, there are some slides with a, a bunch of uh, code and stuff on it. The details of the code won't be important. I'll tell you what the, the important thing is as we get to each sort of slide. The first pillar is Java integration. So Groovy has always been Java's friend. So rather, the, Groovy's uh, development team is fairly small for a, a full-blown language. And we can get away with that simply because we piggyback on top of Java. So there's lots of things where we rely on Java's libraries. Uh, we've mirrored a lot of design decisions that uh, Java took on board that lets us minimize what we need to uh, just work on what we want to be the differences with Java rather than having to make uh, lots of decisions everywhere. So Java's always been Groovy's friend, and as new versions of Java come out, we just try to work out what's now the pain point. So but there used to be a pain point, maybe Java's solved that pain point, we'll move on to the, what the next pain point is. So it allows us to just sort of be the icing on the cake, if you like. Um, that's got, there's some limitations to that. So a lot of our uh, classes that we supply uh, work very, very nicely with Java collections and so on. There's many, many times when that's very, very beneficial, that's really beneficial for integration purposes, but there's also times when we might like to have had a, our own full-blown, super-duper um, collection system. We um, probably will have more and more support for other collection systems over time as well, but, but um, these are some of the things that uh, we've done to, to uh, keep moving forward with the not huge team, so that's what we've done. The integration has always been really important and there is just a really close mesh. You'll, you'll hear about other languages on the JVM describing how, about how, well, how good their integration is, but you can actually think of integration as a sort of a multi-tiered uh, system and when the other people talk about how good their integration is, they've got one or two of the tiers covered off and they cover off those really, really well. And they do things like automatic conversion between their version of a date and their version of a list 
and Java's version of all those things, and they automatically convert. But Groovy typically sits there and just does all the same things as needed, and it just, it's just at a different level, and it, it goes a lot further. So you can do things like have a Groovy class uh, implement a Java interface, and it, that Java interface might extend a, a Groovy interface, and so on. So you can mix and match between um, the two languages at a much, much closer level than with any of the other alternatives. Now, having said that, on the whole, uh, we always, there's always language wars uh, in when you get a t teams of passionate people together. But on the whole, Groovy's been a fairly friendly and um, hasn't tried to sort of take down other communities. So certain communities that I uh, inhabit occasionally seem are, are very, very hostile to anyone outside their own communities. The Groovy community is always, in my experience anyway, has always been fairly friendly. So I can. If uh, someone pops in here and they're a Scala programmer, we'll just say, oh, fine, come along and I'll show you some Groovy and I'll learn a few from, from Scala and, and we'll, we'll both uh, go away being better people. And that kind of ethos, is, is it's actually a, a, a point on the almost last slide that the, the community is, one of, again, one of the uh, awesome parts of, of the, uh, the Groovy ecosystem. But even at the technical level, Groovy sort of said, oh, we'll, we'll play nicely with anything else that plays nicely with the JVM. So if I want, I can write a little bit of Groovy code that calls out into JavaScript code. So here I'm going to call JavaScript code to do factorial. Why I'd want to do that, I don't know. I can do that in less lines of code in Groovy, but just to show that it can easily be done. If I want to call out into R or some other language, it's, uh, I can do factorial in, in R as well if I want, or I can get into all of the statistics packages that might be in R that I might want to get where there's not very many good Groovy li uh, Java libraries or Groovy libraries. And if I want to just be, just want to show off, I can actually uh, write a bit of Groovy code, run it through GrooScript to convert it into JavaScript, and then run that on the JVM through the Nash one engine there. So here I'm going to run JavaScript that came from Groovy and got converted and run it all, and everybody's happy. So just to show off, why not? We can do it. Okay, so just to sum up, Groovy has always tried to uh, Keep, be a friend of Java and be a good citizen on the JVM and integrate well. And we'll, we'll continue to do that as best we can. Obviously, there's sometimes we make different choices, but on the whole, we just try to do that to, to allow you to integrate in with all the huge number of Java systems that are still there. The next pillar I want to look at is scripting support. And we already kind of saw that on the, the, the first slide when I put up some Java code and then we converted it all the way down into, into um, some s much smaller Groovy code. That was actually a Groovy script, so there was no class definition around the outside, no public static void main definition and so on. All of that got sort of automatically added, and that's as part of Groovy script support. So in some sense, it's kind of trivial. So in some sense, you can think of it as a very, just a way to make things uh, less, uh, more terse, make them more succinct. So we can take any classes and we can write much smaller things. But that's oversimplifying it far too much. There's, there is, in fact, a very, very rich framework behind the whole uh, scripting support that's uh, in Groovy. There's a whole range of different engines that can run your scripts with different properties. Some are designed to be sitting on a server and, and uh, looking for files, changing on file systems. Some are designed to be very configurable and, and so on and so forth. There's base scripts, there's binding, there's customizers. So there's actually a very, very rich uh, scripting uh, set of facilities that are there when you need them. And that can be really good in a whole range of scenarios. We're just going to look at one scenario, and then we're going to move on to our next pillar. So this is our scenario. Does anyone know what that's a picture of? It is mountains. <laughs> Where might those mountains be? On Mars. Yes, so, and apparently... The, the, the curvy, the, the sort of white lines that are going down the mountain are in such a formation that it's probably only possible that they are there from water that melted at some time and trickled down the mountain and then refroze. So it means that at some point there was uh, water on Mars, which obviously you obviously know that. So some of you, some of you may not believe me, so what we're going to do is we're going to send out a little rover robot and we're going to program it up in, in Groovy, and that's going to be our little case study, just for a few slides, and we'll see how that might look. So what might, might we do? As programmers, we'd start writing uh, so our domain classes. We might write a robot domain class, write some methods, we'll write a move method, 
and then we'll create a new robot, and then we'll, we'll continue working. We'll, we'll split the team here we'll, in different parts of the room. We'll start working on different bits. So some group will come and add the um, so, and some enums for direction, and another part might be doing some other things. And we'll slowly build up our domain model. Now, is this the, the right way to approach uh, doing this? So, uh, possibly not, because there's, what, what I'm missing here is separation of concerns. So the, the last line, robot.move left, who's going to write that? That's actually going to be the, the operator who's sitting, sitting in Houston, uh, you know, just got the latest positioning of where the robot is and now wants to move it to the next position to do the next bit of search. And that's the only line they want to write. Whereas someone else went, wrote the, sort of the operating system of the robot and they might, it might only get uploaded every, you know, once a month or something, they might give a new version or something. And so most, half of the stuff that's on here is going to be by a different team, have a different life cycle and, and so on. And so it would be good to split those apart. And in fact, that's exactly what the scripting uh, framework is, is designed to cater for. So you'd, you'd actually write your robot operating system and then you'd go and feed it instructions. Okay? And uh, Groovy's got really good DSL support, so it's, we're gonna, at the end of the day, we're going to end up with nice little instructions uh, flying across the wire as well. Um, and uh, it might look pretty trivial there, but there's a really, really powerful... Uh, set of facilities that allow that go into the support that's there. I don't don't have time today to uh, elaborate on all of them. I'm just going to uh, look at this one slide and um, give you a flavour what there. Now there's a lot of code up on there. Don't worry about what, uh, what the code all says. I'll, I'll just tell you what's in there. The, we're defining a, an import customizer which says in my script I'm going to have some imports predefined. I've also got a timeout customizer there which says if we don't hear from the, uh, the robot for two hours, uh, just interrupt because it's, something's gone wrong and we want to reboot. We've got another one that says, oh, I'm going to uh, lock down the language. So if someone ever hacks into this thing, they can't go and system.exit and, and leave the robot in no man's land. Well, actually, I've got a special system.exit customizer, which is a security thing. I'm also going to lock down the language. So not every single feature that my programmers who are writing operating system have available to them will be available to the robot operators. They'll have a limited set of things that will allow them to do. And so I take all of these customizers, I um, add them into a compiler configuration, pass in a binding with some other information that's going to be available to my robot operators, and that's how I declare my DSL, and it'll have a different life cycle and, and so on um, to the instructions. The instructions will be very, very simple. And that's what the operator sends across the wire, across, across um, I guess, HTTP 4.5 by the time we get to Mars. I don't know. Later on, I'll very, very briefly show you how we'll even take that example further. And we'll see things like move forward at three kilometres an hour. That'll be in another pillar, but that'll be later on. So the scripting support, another one of the pillars. It's, it, it, you might think it's very rarely used, but it gets used in a whole lot of places. Um, interacting with different groups in an organisation, uh, writing tests that, that uh, need to be viewed by non-developers and a whole lot of places. I mean, when you write a Gradle build file or a very uh, many of the... In lots of other places where you're just using that scripting support and you may not even realise it. And lots of security contexts where it can be uh, relevant as well. The um, next pillar, multi-paradigm support. Okay, so... Obviously, Groovy's heritage is from OO. So it took all the OO features that are in uh, Java and added some things to that. It also added in first-class functional support for via closures and other things. And there's the ability to use other paradigms as well, Lo uh, log logical constraint programming, data, data flow programming through various libraries, reactive, reactive uh, styles of programming. And there's other things that you can do that, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see that sees how you can do just a couple of those. So in some sense, it's, it's Groovy gives you quite a bit of flexibility to, to pick and choose what's appropriate for the task at hand. Now, for OO features, again, we could just do a whole talk on that, so let's not. I'll just pick out, it, the green is sort of the things that it adds over the top of Java, if you like. The black is things that Java's got and the green's extras, it's, it's a little bit fuzzy in a few places with, uh, in Java 8, but we'll just go with that for now. I'm just going to talk about traits. 
Those of you who know uh, Java 8, it's got a thing called default methods. Traits are like a super version of default methods, let you do a whole range of additional things that uh, over and above what default methods that you do. So here we've got a, a kangaroo class, and it's going to implement this trait, and by virtue of doing that, it's going to have a, a jump method, and that all happens at, uh, during the compilation process. Okay. Does anyone know who wrote this piece of code? Grace Hopper. Does anyone know who Grace Hopper is? You should. If, if you don't know who Grace Hopper is, uh, make sure you go and Google it and, and find out. Functional, functional facilities. Again, there's a tiny bits of functional support in Java by, um, on its own. Groovy adds a whole lot more. I'm just going to look at a few features. We, again, we could do a whole, whole talk just on the functional capabilities of Groovy. Let's not. I'm just going to show you um, a very small thing here. And what I'm actually going to do is uh, combine a bit of OO stuff with some functional. And so many of you th probably think, oh, oh, I don't ever use functional. But if you're using Groovy, you're probably using it everywhere. So here I've just got a canonical. Uh, person class with a couple of fields. I'm going to create three, three people, and now I'm going to do find all that have an age less than 40, collect the uppercase version of their name, sort them, join them with a comma, and then I'll check the end result. So each of those things, find all, collect, and so on, are taking closures, which are functions. So we're doing functional programming there. We can actually do a whole lot of more functional things. So um, if instead of writing this find all ITA less than 40, I can write some closures in a more fancy ways that might be doing fancier things for me. So on the right hand side, I'm going to create a young closure that's actually uh, allows me to compare a person with any threshold, not just 40. I'm going to uh, then do partial application. So, so the R curry, I'm going to curry in an argument as the second argument, one on the right hand side of that closure. I'm going to pass in 40, and then I'm going to memoize it, which means now uh, every time I call that with the same person, it's going to remember what the result was last time, whether it was true or not. Now, I shouldn't actually be doing... I, didn't, I should make uh, the age field immutable in order to be able to uh, do this little trick. We'll ignore that for, the, for, for the, just right now. Now, instead of calling find all with, the, with uh, the explicit closure, we can just call pass in the young closure and off we go. So we can start mixing and matching OO and functional styles um, to our heart's content and off we go. Those of you who are working with Java 8, you can do the streams versions as well. We, we, uh, just, just because we can. The other thing that I want to... There's been a real push towards uh, functional programming. And there's lots of really nice things about functional programming, and you, you should go and learn lot, lots about it. But the thing that I uh, uh, am often disappointed about is that people often move over as a, to take on functional as, a, as a, a new religion, and they drink the Kool-Aid, and then they think everything that's not functional is bad. And that's actually um, a bit disappointing, because there's actually lots of times when an imperative solution is the, the appropriate solution to have. And there's, in fact, lots of times when non-functional but non-imperative solutions like logic programming, constraint programming, data flow programming are, in fact, better alternatives that you should be using. And uh, people are uh, not giving those enough attention. It would be good if they did. So we're, I'm just going to quickly show you one logic programming example and one data flow. And the, the crescendo at the uh, end of the talk, we'll, we'll come back and look at uh, this particular example again, uh, and we'll make a DSL out of it. But for now, we won't do DSLs. We'll just look at using a constraint programming library. Now, the code will be too small for you. Uh, most of you are at the, at the back of the room, I imagine. But I'm just going to explain what what we're doing in this code. Where, well, first of all, have you all seen this uh, the crane and tortoise problem? It's we we in in Australia in, back in my day at least. It was one of the problems that. Sometime during primary school, you'd be, your teacher would come and get you to go and solve, and you'd, you'd have to. It'll be a br little brain twister that you'd have to go and solve. And the, the puzzle goes that cranes have two legs, tortoises have four. There are seven animals, twenty legs. How many of each animal? Okay, you've probably heard that or some variant with different animals, different whatever it might be. And so it's 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 just a, a logic problem. And we could go and write some uh, groovy code and. It, an imperative or functional style to go and solve that and, and uh, do brute force or various other approaches. 
But what a constraint library does, if you think of, if you've heard of Prolog or whatever, you, you just specify things in a very declarative way as a, con as a logical constraint, and then it's got a built-in uh, solver engine inside it. it. Might use backtracking and other things. It does it does the brute force still, but it does it all uh, according to a particular strategy that it's got for solving these sorts of problems, and it does it all for you. And it, it becomes a very very declarative way of doing things. So we've got one line here that says that the number of cranes, it's some variable. We don't know what that is. It's, a, it's between zero and the, and the total number of animals, seven, because we, we know there's seven animals. So the number of tortoises is somewhere between zero and seven. The number of cranes is between zero and seven. Then I also have some other properties, the number of crane legs and the number of tortoise legs. And they're not actual variables that I want you to go and solve. They just happen to be properties that are related to some other variables that you already know about. And so... The number of crane legs is four times, uh, two times the number of cranes, and the number of tortoise legs is four times the number of tortoises. So we're just telling the engines a little bit more info. And then, we're gonna, then we go and tell it, oh, by the way, that number of cranes variable, when you add it to the number of tortoises variable, that better equal the total number of animals. And that number of, cranes, uh, number of crane legs, when you add that to the number of tortoise legs, that better equal the total number of legs. And that's all you do. You've just specified your constraints, and then you say, please go solve that for me. And then you go and ask it, did you find a solution? Oh, yes, you did, and you print it out. Or it comes back and says, no, couldn't solve that, sorry. And these are, uh, it might sound quite trite, the little example that I've um, given you there, but these are actually very, very rich and powerful libraries. They've got different search engines and strategies and knapsack problem solvers and all sorts of things built into them so they actually handle a huge range of uh, optimization and um, uh, traveling salesmen, bin packing, all sorts of uh, problems um, that you, you might find very hard to write yourself. They've got an engine that just solves these sorts of equations. So you can go and leverage those sorts of engines. So consider, consider doing that. And it's easy to do from Groovy as well as other languages. Data flow programming is, again, another way to do very declarative programming. I'm going to use the one out of Jeepers. There's been full talks on um, Jeepers yeah, yesterday, and I don't know if there's any more. Uh, later, probably no, there's no more, no more today. Um, but you can find out lots more of inf information on Jeepers. It's got a lot of uh, capabilities. If, you, if you've never used it before, I would actually not recommend necessarily starting with Dataflow. You're going to get most bang for buck looking at data parallelism. And if you've got a problem, what they call embarrassingly parallel, ones that just easily uh, can be done in parallel, you'll get lots of bang for buck going using Jeepers for solving that kind of problem. Um, that's not what I'm here to talk about today. I'm going to do data flow. So I'm going to look at this particular currency problem here. Don't worry about the first line. I've just gone to define four uh, functions, four closures. And now I've got some sort of relationship that I'm going to compute based on using those four functions. And I want to, I want to check that what the answer is. Now, if I want to uh, actually uh, uh, solve that, I can actually just do it using asynchronous programming and try to, well, I can do it sequentially, that's fine. But I want to use, I've got multiple cores here. You know, uh, why can't I just go and use, I've got four functions there, why can't I actually go and just use all four cores, one on each function and solve it? Well, it turns out that some of those, so F, to get the value of, um, for D, I'm going to call function F3, but I've got to pass in C, and C's the result of doing F2. So I can't actually start that one until I've finished another one. So there's actually a task graph. There's a graph of things that need to happen. And um, if I want to do multiple cores, you can actually go and do that by hand and do hand synchronization and so on. But you can just go and use futures, asynchronous programming, and Groovy's, uh, the Jeepers library's got support for that. So you can go and do it manually. You can, you can do your little graph here, work out what's happening, do some asynchronous calls, and uh, get one core do it going down one side, one core going down the other side, and you get your result. But what Dataflow would say is, no, just declaratively tell me what needs to happen, and I'll do the rest for you. And so with Dataflow, you just say, yep, I've got these tasks. I'm gonna, uh, first task, I'm just going to set up one of my variables, then I'm going to call my functions, and then I'm going to get my result at the end. We, I'm just going to tell you what those tasks are. I can actually tell you those tasks in any order. It doesn't matter. They're just declarative expressions of the task. You go get the result, and then Dataflow will go and solve that. So um, it's got some really neat properties ab about it um, in terms of uh, 
if you want to detect whether any deadlocks in there, am, am I, is one of the tasks that I declare actually waiting for something that I'm waiting on, you know, if I've got a circular definition, basically. And the, the beauty of it is that kind of, if you've got something like a, a deadlock or whatever, that's detectable statically. You don't have to, you can detect those sorts of things and uh, work, work out whether you've got any issues. So there's a lot of really neat properties about that sort of thing. So data flow is a really nice thing to uh, look at for, for a range of certain problems. Okay, so this pillar is all about Groovy will give you the flexibility to do OO, functional, and other things, and that's good. That's a great place to be. Gradual typing. There's lots and lots of debating about typing. Um, I think it's a little bit sad. My PhD topic is all about theorem proving. So, you know, that my, my, the goal of my career is that theorem proving will be relevant to the general IT community, and I'm, I'm, it's, it's looking like it might be hit and misses whether I, whether I can actually make it that far before the, it actually becomes relevant to the community. So I'm someone who is a strong believer in having the, the, in my toolkit, the ability to do very, very strong theorems. But I'm also a very pragmatic person, and I need to get stuff done, and I need tools that let me do stuff quickly, and so on. So I'd like to have the ability to do a whole range of different things, from stuff that's not giving me much tool support to something that's giving me lots of tool support, and I'll choose the appropriate tool for the, for the job. I think I've, um, you know, we, we're all uh, adults here. We can all work out when we need extra support and when we don't. So that's, that's where the sort of typing debate sort of sits. And uh, Groovy's lets you be very, very flexible. It's got gradual typing. So we can, for the my pets variable up the top, we can not bother defining its types. For uh, your pets, we can put types there if we want. The, the uh, issue that uh, people who prefer static typing will say is, well, I don't want to wait till compile time to get the feedback. But I'm sitting inside IntelliJ and I'm getting that feedback at type time. I don't have to wait till compile time. It's putting little yellow squigglies or whatever underneath as I'm typing things. I don't wait till compile time. I'm getting feedback much earlier than, than compile time. Why am I having a debate about compile time versus runtime? No, no, I'm, I'm way ahead of that. And uh, IntelliJ is giving me that sort of support, but only to a certain degree. Okay? It, the IntelliJ didn't turn anything red. It doesn't know, it, it, it can't give me full support, but it's giving me a little bit of support. So there's many scenarios where that's good enough and other places where it's not good enough. And I'm in control. I can just, as we saw before, I can go and write an edge checker when I need extra support, or I can let duck typing and dynamic typing and everything come into play. So here, I, if I want to, here I've got an adder, and it'll work automatically for numbers and strings. I don't need to put typing information there or invent something that's a string or a, uh, a number that can be added or anything. I don't need to invent a type hierarchy that allows me to write the, uh, the, the adder type method. I can use duck typing when it's appropriate. And when I want to, I can go and add more, more, more things. I can, the, the beauty of the type checker is that it's got all the full, the full inference that you'd expect to have. So even with full static type checking there, you don't need to, to supply list of string anymore for my pets, but in fact the compiler knows that it's a list of string. And as we saw before, it's extensible. Just a couple of examples on the extensibility. Here's a, if, if you've ever used sprintf in Java, you'll know that it's got a var arg object as the parameter. So it's got a string, the format string, and then a var arg of objects. So, so in the, my format string, I've got percent %s, percent %d, percent %tf, and that's going to uh, expect certain kinds of parameters. So percent %s is going to be a string, and then the other, other formatting uh, placeholders will be other types that are there. So it just, it's just an object uh, array. So even with full Java's static type checking, if, if I get the types wrong when I'm feeding things in, I won't know till runtime, and I'll get errors at runtime. So um, that's as far as uh, Java can take me. But with Groovy, I can, I can actually put a sprintf type checker uh, into my comp uh, compilation process, and now it's going to tell me at compile time that, oh, I've stuffed the types up. I've got a percent %d, and I thought that was, in my mind, I was thinking percent %d, oh, it's date, isn't it? No, that's decimal. And so I, I got the date and the number around the wrong way. It's percent %t is time. That's where the date's supposed to be. And 
I didn't know that. The compiler will tell me, so we can, we can do that. Here's another example where I'm writing SQL statements. I don't need to wait till... Uh, so if Java's not going to help me there. It's expecting a string going to the, to, the, uh, to the database, and if I'm querying the wrong database or the wrong table or the wrong uh, column, I won't know till runtime. We can actually go and uh, check all those things at compile time if we want. As well as type checking, I can actually do compile static. And compile static says, actually, forget all this dynamic stuff that you've uh, been doing. Make it as, just like Java as much as you can. And that's what compile static does. So in this particular example here, I've got two methods in my class. I'm going to put compile static just on one of the methods. And that will then spit out code that cannot be dynamic. And it'll be very much like what Java would do. This one happens to have a g-string inside it, so it won't be exactly what Java would do, because Java doesn't have one of those. But in general, the code that would be spat, spat out by the compiler when you have compile static will look, the bytecode will look very, very, uh, very, very similar to what Java would produce. Now, in this particular class, I, I can't put it on my whole class, because the make piece method is calling ant builder, and it's going to then call an echo method. Ant builder doesn't have an echo method. There happens to be an echo task in ant, and this ant builder will end up calling that echo task. So it's a dynamic feature. So in this particular class, I want to mix and match between static and dynamic properties, and Groovy's going to let me do that. I could, if I wanted to, put compile static on the class and then turn it off for my make piece method as well, so that both those capabilities are there. Why would I ever want to use compile static? Uh, pretty, for, for two reasons. A, I might want to not have any dynamic stuff in play because I don't know other people might be playing around doing weird wacky metaprogramming and I don't want that to affect me. So I might lock it down, turn it off. B, performance. Okay? And with that compile static, there's a whole lot of benchmarks where Groovy is the same. Some, sometimes even slightly better than Java, sometimes slightly worse than Java, but on the whole pre pretty much line ball with what uh, Java would give you. Same um, order of magnitude and sometimes right down to the number of milliseconds even. Okay, that's the, the pillar. So Groovy is good because it's going to let me be in control of what kind of typing regime I want to have. Fast when I want it, flexible when I want it, strict when I want it. Next pillar, metaprogramming. I haven't got a lot of time on this, so uh, you'll have all seen this before. Reverse is a method that Groovy automatically adds for you on strings. If you go look at Java Lang string, there's no reverse method. Uh, Groovy adds that for you. So it's using uh, metaprogramming, runtime metaprogramming, because it's actually the string class itself. We've got no control. We can't change the string class itself that comes with Java, but the runtime metaprogramming system knows when you're doing operations on strings and it supplies an extra method for you and you can use that you can also do it yourself. So here we're going to add a swap case method to the string class, and we can then call swap case on string. So that's runtime metaprogramming. Um, it's very, very powerful. I, I didn't show you the little uh, footnote. You can shoot yourself in the foot if you abuse runtime metaprogramming. So runtime metaprogramming is very, very powerful. We need it, um, but don't necessarily use it absolutely everywhere. Don't go and add huge numbers of ob uh, methods to object, Java Lang object, or Java Lang, even Java Lang string. Be, judicious in, in how you might go and change that. Okay, there's other way, there's also intercepting methods. So there's, there happens to be a one method inside the foo class, but there's no two or three methods, but I can intercept that and do various things. You've probably all seen this sort of stuff before. Those capabilities might seem trite when I'll go and look at that one, two, three method, when am I ever going to use that? But in fact, those dynamic capabilities are what's behind the, the uh, gpath expressions behind builders, behind a lot of the dynamic capabilities that are in Groovy. So they're very, very important. We want them. We don't want them to ever go away. We're just going to be augmenting them with static stuff when it's appropriate. And so um, obviously there's no host property or service property or methods, whatever, inside an XML file. You know, so um, these are all dynamic uh, aspects of the language. Compile time metaprogramming, what we, what we say is, well, we don't want to necessarily have the overhead of doing all that, the extra checks and looking stuff up and um, looking up meta classes at runtime. It might be a performance uh, problem for some of us. We, we might just not be confident that we've, we know exactly what's in play if lots of people are 
all putting lots of uh, metaprogramming in, in, into the equation. So um, some, sometimes we want to take the hit at compile time, do some changes there and not necessarily, um, uh, and potentially have more IDE support and not necessarily have as much flexibility. So that's uh, what compile time metaprogramming does. You've probably all seen this with AST transforms and so on. There's a two string annotation added to the person class, the compiler throws that away and puts a two string method in your class. Okay, And there is a, uh, a life cycle behind how all that works. I haven't got time today to go into it. It's um, Groovy's got a, well, I'll go on right on to the next slide. Groovy's got a nine phase compiler. The early parts of that compiler are all about taking your source code and putting it into an abstract syntax tree. Abstract syntax tree is the compiler's data structures. And then it's got some middle phases that build up a richer and richer model of your program. So different phases of the compilation are, are doing things, the different tr AST transforms are running, they're tweaking things, they're adding more information, There's, they're doing extra searches, finding classes and resolving classes and so on. You're getting a richer and richer domain model. And then the later phases of the compiler uh, spit that into bytecode. So that's what's, what's happening. AST transforms put us in control of the process that's, that's going on there. And so you, even as a user of the language, can step in and, and tweak things um, at a very, very fine grain level of detail by using these facilities. You all will have seen this before. I, I've, I've given this example and other people often do too. If you want to write immutable classes, there's a whole bunch of rules. You can go and look them up in the Effective Java book. You can write the Java code for them. Groovy would sort of say, well, most of that's boilerplate. Why don't we just say immutable class person? Most of you have probably used this. Um, that's a really, really powerful facility, not just for write, typing less code, but what you, you know is that every time you use this, every single one of those rules that are in the book have all been, have all been done. You, you know you're not going to forget one or leave one out or whatever. Um, the, the, they've all been hard-baked into the, into the transform. So... Um, that's its power over and above, just making it nice and succinct, telling you, oh yes, this is an immutable class. It's very obvious from there. If you go and look at a class that's uh, got all the, that follows all the patterns of the immutable pattern in the Java Effective Book, it's not always obvious that that's in fact what's going on. Maybe there's one or two things that are slightly different for this class, who knows? Now, the nice thing is, and again, this gets back to, we've always tried to evolve the language to allow any features that we're using to be exposed to the end users when it makes sense. And right now, you can go and write these AST transforms and you need to write code that are using these internal compiler data structures. So new constructor call expression, dot make, argument list expression, dot whatever. Um, the, with macros, which are in 2.5, you can actually now write that stuff in Groovy code. So um, everything's becoming simpler to use and, and easier to use, and um, that's a really powerful feature. So the language that you're using for writing Groovy is the same uh, language that you're using for writing the uh, AST transforms, writing your macros. So that's, that's awesome. Um, th it's got some, a whole lot of flexibility for doing substitution and so on. I won't go into the details. Uh, there's, a whole, there's things like AST matching, so I can go and write little... Uh, Optimizers over and above what Groovy might be optimizing, I might go and start trawling through my code, and whenever I see one plus one as an AST expression in my code, I'm going to replace that with two automatically. So I'm doing inline optimizations on my code, writing little optimizers and things. So I can do that as a macro with just a few lines of code. Here's another little example using um, null safe. You've all seen null safe before. Turns out, um, well, we all know that's prone to null pointer exceptions. You all know what you'd have to do in Java to get around it, quite a bit of ugly code. In the Parrot parser, you can now, even with the indexing, you can do safe indexing as well as safe navigation. That's all well and good, but what if you didn't even want to put all those question marks in there? Well, you can easily go and write yourself a little null safe macro, and it'll automatically put a question mark anywhere that it finds in that expression. So all indexing, all dots. And that turns out to be about uh, it's, you just write a little mac, uh, macro methods, you put macro on a method, and it becomes one of the methods that's available globally throughout your program. Okay. And there's a whole bunch more. So you can write your own pattern matching. So you've, you're, waiting, you're waiting for the Groovy team to uh, write, finally write the pattern matching support that we've been talking about for a couple of years. We haven't finished yet. 
you can go write yourself one in a few hundred, uh, less than 100 lines of code. You, want to, uh, you like Spock and you like all of its nice support that it gives you for testing. Wouldn't that be good if I could use it in my real code? You can go write yourself a do with data macro and put that in your non-testing code um, and it's only, again, a small number of lines of code. So that's the, the, the pillar. The, the uh, metaprogramming is uh, one of the really powerful features. If you combine all of those things together, add in some command chains, which uh, move forward at three dot kilometers dot div that h is what the actual line above actually gets parsed into by the Groovy compiler. So that's actual code. That's what it gets converted into. If you can combine this with the scripting, with the, all the other things that we've been talking about, um, this is, is a few examples here of doing DSLs. I'm going to skip over those. And uh, examples in uh, other languages as well for the polyglot people. <laughs> um, I'm going to come back to here. This, this was the example I showed you. In fact, with the, um, the uh, constraint programming library, that is, in fact, my groovy code. I've got a little DSL, and that's, that isn't just an English expression of the language. That's my code, and I can write... Um, this is the DSL that's sitting there behind it. Um, I can write another line of code and rerun it, and I get a different answer popping out. So that's actually my, the code for the program. Now, if I don't like the, the plain text there, I can actually do type-checked versions. So remember I, I told you how you're probably going to have squiggly lines under some of those if, if you're in IntelliJ. It's not going to know what's going on. You can actually go and get rid of all the squiggly lines. And you can, you can go further by adding your, and you'll, you'll, you can do completion if you see that. You can go further, and here I'm going to actually go and check that the names of the animals that you're typing in here are actually found in an animal database on the web. And so we're going to add that as a little uh, type provider. And now we can go and run our program, and we can start putting in animals, any animals that we find off the web. And the program won't compile if you type in some sort of expression that it doesn't recognize as, as a valid animal. So this is sort of piecing together all the bits and pieces of the talk. So there's some really nice things in Groovy. There's a really nice ecosystem. You've probably all been hearing about uh, all some of the some of the projects here already. And there's an awesome community. Uh, do you recognise yourself? I'm sure all of you are in there somewhere. Um, you can go find out who all the contributors are on the on GitHub if you want. Um, and there's a uh, Oh, by the way, you're, you're supposed to appear on the list as well. That's what the mirror is all about. And there's a whole range of people using Groovy. So um, don't be afraid to talk to other, to other people in your organizations and get them um, hooked on Groovy. There's lots of uh, positives happening in the Groovy community at the moment, and um, you should all uh, be comfortable that you can keep using Groovy for a long time to come. And there happens to be a good book on Groovy out, apparently. So. Okay, uh, thanks very much. I, th I think that's uh, it. Is there any questions or um, anything? I can't really see hands from, from back here, but... Oh, uh, yes? Where, whereabouts? Uh, oh, yes, type alias thing, yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah, that's what that is, yep. So... So if I do import Java lang string as foo, I can go you know, foo, yeah, foo something, and that'll be a string. So yeah. Yes. Well, so the um, yes. Um, in, in general, it, it can do. So what, uh, 
for an, an annotation might be doing um, various things inside it. So I could have an annotation that actually had a compile static uh, embedded inside it or, or all sorts of things. The immutable one doesn't. Um, so provided you're not doing anything that tries to mutate, it'll be the same as if you wrote it all out by hand, what, what you saw on the previous slide. So there's no performance gain. There'll be a tiny performance penalty during compilation, but it's minuscule. In fact, it'll probably be, cancel out with having to parse the big file anyway. So, um, so I'm thinking that um, having that, it would be having final to all the does add final to all your uh, properties, yes. In, in in general, some some of there will be uh, in general using AST transforms could impact performance. Um, it depends on uh, what gets baked into the AST transforms. A, a lot of times we're trying to bake into the AST tra transforms ways to improve performance, and so you'll benefit from that if we've done that. Other AST transforms, there isn't really any benefit performance benefit there. It just depends on the nature of the transform. Okay, we might call it quits. Thanks very much, everyone.